All right, so I've got six o'clock here, so I am mm -hmm. going to welcome everyone. Good afternoon or good evening. Welcome to the General Baptist Annual Session. You are in workshop entitled Sermon Building Slash Planning. My name is Minister Deborah Wilson. It's my pleasure to be your virtual support for this evening and to present our facilitator, Reverend Dr. James Worthy. And every time I um, read your name, I think about the basketball player. <laughs> but anyway. I tell, I tell folks I'm the short, fat version. Short. That's what I... <laughs> But he is a second generation preacher, pastor, native of Charlotte, North Carolina, is married to the former Felicia McCoy of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They're the proud yeah. parents of two daughters and the grandparents of one. And I had to mention that because you had that first in your bio. So it has to be mm -hmm. important. So Absolutely. Dr. Uh, Worthy currently serves as the 11th pastor of the historic St. James Missionary Baptist Church in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. He was educated in the public schools of Charlotte, Mecklenburg County and holds several advanced degrees. Now, I'm going to stop there, but please go ahead and read his complete bio on the General Baptist uh, State Convention website for more detail. His PowerPoint presentation is in the chat, or his Word document is in the chat for your use to download, along with a link to Giveify, so that you can donate to the convention to further its work in our state and beyond. And with that, I'm going to present to you the Reverend Dr. James Worthy. Please help me receive him with a rowdy with a hearty, hearty virtual applause here. Bless you. <laughs> Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. I certainly greet each of you with Jesus joy tonight, and I am certainly thankful and grateful. Please pardon my voice. I've had a homegoing service earlier today, uh, and it was a homegoing celebration. So uh, I'm recuperating <clears throat> from that. Uh, but nevertheless, I am certainly grateful and we celebrate the leadership of our convention and certainly grateful to have all of you connecting with us. We're going to jump right in because um, we, of course, are working against a time constraint. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we thank God for the time constraint because that keeps us so, keeps us focused and uh, zeroing in on our assignment. I trust everyone can see the screen as we have our PowerPoint presentation coming up. Um, as it has been shared already, uh, there is a Word document uh, that has been placed in the chat for you to download. So you can follow along uh, in our time of discussion. Uh, due to time, what I'd like to do, if you would permit me, is walk through the presentation. Let me just kind of share with us for about a good 35, 40 minutes. And then we'll take our remaining time to just dialogue. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask those at this point. I will also encourage you if you should think, if you're like me, you know, you've reached that half a century plus mark, uh, you, you are subject to forget things quickly. Uh, so please feel free if you need to, to place your questions in the chat. And uh, as we get closer to that time, we will refer to that uh, for our beginning moments. Um, today's session is entitled Sermon Preparation, Sermon Building, and I've chosen to entitle it or subtitle it Position to Proclaim. Uh, basically, we want to talk about some techniques for sermon preparation, and additionally, I want to talk a little bit about Bible study preparation because I am of the opinion that really, although it is a different format, two different formats, the modes of preparation are somewhat similar. And so I want to spend some time just talking with that. Uh, let's, let's deal with our objectives. There we are. Uh, our objectives, of course, uh, in tonight's sharing is I want to share some techniques of preparation using what I call the inductive method of Bible study. And we're going to spend a little bit, a minute or two tonight talking about what the inductive method of Bible study really is and how it comes together. Uh, I am of the firm belief that truth be told, one of the greatest foundational pieces to preparing for the preaching moment is the ability to study the Bible. Um, I often tell people comically, Paul told Timothy, rather Paul did not tell Timothy, preach to show yourself approved unto God. He said, study to show yourself approved. And study comes from a Greek word that simply means to dig deep. We're going to dig deep into the riches of God's word to gain understanding. So we're going to talk about that uh, on tonight. Secondly, I want to share some things from my own experience of how you can prepare for the preaching moment, the teaching moment, without overwhelming yourself. 
sometimes we can take on too much and it, be, it can become a bit much. So I want to talk with you about that and just share some tips from my own experience, which is going to fall right in line to the meat of our gathering tonight, the sermon and Bible study prep techniques, just some things that I have seen uh, in my soon to be 32 years of preaching the gospel. I started young. Uh, those 32 years, things that I have learned along the way. And then I want to open it up definitely to just hear some of your thoughts, some of your ideas, some of your techniques, because as the word of God teaches us, iron sharpens iron. We're going to sharpen and help one another uh, through the process. And then we'll wrap up with our time of questions, <clears throat> excuse me, and our time of wrap up on this evening. So let's get right into it. Let's talk a little bit about this inductive method of Bible study, because I'm of the firm belief as preachers of the gospel, uh, the foundation to our preaching is found in how much time, effort, and energy we put into preparation. Uh, when I was in seminary, I was told that for every minute I preach, I should be willing to give at least one hour of study time. And I can tell you very early in ministry, uh, that was a whole lot easier said than done. And now that I am in pastoring, I have found out even the more that that is still a whole lot easier said than done. But there is a method, and I want to share that method with us this evening. There is a method to which we can spend time in study of the Word of God. Please believe me when I tell you, when we talk about sermon preparation, we're not talking about sermon performance. And there is a difference. There's a difference between preparation and performance. And sadly, what I see in today's time is there is more focus on the performance than there is the preparation. We want to spend more time on the riffs and the tune and the hoop, but we are not providing meat that is going to feed our people. You know, uh, very early in, in ministry, I had a homiletics professor who taught us that we had to remember our sainted senior who is waiting for you to take them to the cross. But before you get them to the cross, you've got to educate them on the importance of the cross. So, you know, when we talk about this, I want to focus more on the preparation piece because I firmly believe that if we are fully prepared as preachers, the performance will come through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's talk a little bit about what inductive Bible study is. Inductive Bible study is a method of studying the scripture that seeks to find meaning in the original context. And then once we have an understanding of the original context, then we seek to apply it to our everyday lives. I'm of the opinion, uh, brothers and sisters, that you really in the preaching moment can't have one without the other. The only way that you're going to properly apply scripture to everyday life is you've got to take the time to go back and study it in its original context. I can tell you from experience, I cannot count how many times I have missed the mark and have taken scripture out of context because I did not properly study it to understand what was going on at that time. Hold on to the word context, because I'm going to come back and dive into that in just a moment. Uh, when we think about who inductive Bible study is for, that Bible study is great for those of us who want to take a deep dive into Scripture. Please believe me when I tell you, especially uh, serving a church of seven generations, what I have discovered is the great responsibility of making sure that we are properly presenting the gospel because you've got a group of folks who are those academically minded that really want to help me see what you're saying. But at the same time, as we talked about that sainted senior who has experienced life and is just looking for some hope. And then in many of our congregations, when we stand before them to preach, keep in mind that there's a group really stuck almost in the middle. And the assignment has to be, how do I make this word live without allowing it to lose its value? So in this sense, inductive Bible study is for the academically minded, and it is for the curiosity driven. 
if you want to learn scripture, if you want to be able to answer those questions, this is the Bible study for you. And I, in my 30 years of preaching, have found this to be one of the most effective ways for me to prepare uh, for preaching and teaching moments. And we're going to talk about that as well on this evening. When do we use inductive Bible study? We use inductive Bible study when we want to get the behind the scenes tour of a story. And that's important when it comes to, as Paul says, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is so important because oftentimes, because we don't deal with scripture as it relates to time, setting, cultures, what was happening in history at that time, we can often fall into the trap of taking it out of context. And oftentimes I have seen this, particularly uh, with, with our younger counterparts, is one of the things that I encourage them to study and understand that we cannot get so caught up in the emotionalism that we lose sight of education. Please let me say that again. As preachers of the gospel, we cannot get so caught up in emotionalism that we lose sight of educating. All right. Jesus told us in the Great Commission that we are to teach them to observe all things whatsoever he has commanded us. So in order for this to be effective, we're going to need some tools. We got to have some tools. Well, I think without a doubt, one of the first tools we are going to need is a Bible. That's a given. Secondly, we're going to need a relationship with God. Because when it comes to preparing for the preaching moment, we can easily prepare a sermon based on our study of scripture, but the challenge of making the scripture relevant to the present time is going to require that relationship with God that allows your ear to remain close to God's mouth so that you can receive what needs to be given to the people. I'm, I'm of the belief and I'm a firm believer that the only way we are going to really help people in this present age is we have got to stay sensitive to the voice of God, even in our study of the word, so that we can make it apply. Of course, commentaries, Bible dictionaries, Bible handbooks, um, and, and the list goes on and on. I mean, if you, if you can find a lexicon that will go into Hebrew and Greek all of that is, is are good tools, but you see the first two, you're going to need a Bible and a relationship with God. I heard Dr. Bass say this morning during uh, our general board meeting, he made an awesome point this morning that sometimes we can make scripture so complicated that we lose sight of the original story. The original story is Jesus came, gave his life and died for us. That's the message that we've got to be willing to preach. So when we think about these essentials, of course, we talked about that, that Bible and having that relationship with God. Um, I would also encourage a good study Bible. Um, Thompson Chain Reference is a great resource. Uh, Dake Annotated is a great resource. Um, these are some of the resources that I turn to uh, in a moment's notice of study and preparation, um, particularly the Dake. I, I must, you know, free commercial for Dake. Uh, this, I must say, you know, the Dake is an essential tool, is a great tool to have uh, because it does challenge you to go back to the original language of the Bible uh, in helping you to understand. Um, of course, especially not only with teaching, but definitely with preaching, a good pen and a piece of paper to take some notes would definitely be helpful. And I would definitely want to encourage us as we build sermons. I often tell people, even if you preach as they call it extemporaneously, by that I mean if you preach without notes, it is still a good idea to spend time writing. I, if, if Even if you don't even write a full manuscript, if you just prepare some sort of a sketch or an outline, and even if you don't use it in the pulpit, it's good for you because it's going to help you prepare a mental guide so that you can properly share the word and not, if I could put it this way, be rambling all over the place. Sometimes I can only speak for myself. There are times that I have found myself just rambling. And it's only because, one, I didn't do proper study. 
And two, I didn't take time to sort of set a guide. You know, most sometimes in my extemporaneous preaching moments, if nothing else, and just having that guide with a few points that you want to highlight on in scripture, it helps you keep the flow of the message going. Because keep this in mind, and I share this with preachers, the average time that you can really maintain a person's attention is anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, especially, please don't take this the wrong way, especially if you're not saying nothing, you'll lose them. And, and, and I can tell you from experience, and, and really, I tell preachers, I know good when it's time for me to shut it down. Because when it gets to a place that they are responding and they are saying amen and they are pushing you and all of a sudden they get quiet, they are basically telling you, okay, we have absorbed enough. We have received enough. You know, the word of God is a buffet that's bigger than Golden Corral, but the reality of it is, is we can't give it all to them in one time. So once they get to a place where they are full, they will basically be ready to let you know it's time to wind down. Or as the old preachers used to tell us, that's your moment to take them to the cross. So, <laughs> you know, always be mindful of that. When we think about inductive Bible study, there are three keys that I need us to hold on to. Three keys, and then we're going to get right into our meat. Number one, observation. That's first and foremost. When we are studying scripture, we are preparing sermons, we are doing our proper diligence and study to the word of God. The first key that you want to look for is observation. By that, we want to know what is the scripture passage saying? And your assignment in this moment is to summarize the passage of scripture in your own words. We want to talk about the who, the what, the when, and the where. And this is all in your moment of studying and preparing to share the message. What's happening in the passage? What, who are the main persons? Who are the people that we're dealing with? Where did they come from? What are the culture of the times? Why was, this is a big one, why was it in scripture in the first place? Why is it placed in the canon of scripture uh, in the first place. This is all in your phase of observation, that first step of preparing to really go in and determine and to gain understanding of what this passage is saying. And when you think about that word observation, really the biggest question there is, what do you see? In your study, what is it that you are seeing what is it that is being revealed to your heart, mind, and spirit that is worth communicating to a congregation of people who are ready to hear the word? So that, that's where our preparation begins in the study of scripture, understanding the observation piece. The second key to this, this preparing of study of the word of God is interpretation. Once you have seen what the word is saying, here's what you need to figure. What does this passage mean? How does this passage fit in scripture where it is recorded? This is what we call historical context. Historically, what was going on? What were the significance? What are the events? You are really focusing here on the how and the why. And in just a moment, I'm going to show you why the observation and the interpretation are so crucial. It is important that we get it right in the first two steps, simply because the third step is the key that really is going to minister to the people. It is that third key of application and revelation. When we look at this, we're seeking to determine what does this passage mean not only to you, but what does it mean to you to a point that you can communicate it to somebody else. From personal experience, I can tell you some of the greatest sermons you will ever preach will be the sermons that are built out of your own experience, the own testings of your faith, the own trials of your faith, the things that you have gone through and have seen the hand of God pull you through. 
These are going to be the most important, and I can tell you will be some of the most powerful sermons that you will ever preach. But it has to be done through proper observation, through correct interpretation, so that you can provide an accurate application. What does this passage mean? What can we learn from the passage? You know, I, I often use this as an illustration. We talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And Lord knows that's a powerful message uh, that's found in the Old Testament of how God delivered them and protected them, even in the midst of such a horrific situation. But now I've got to be able to take that story and make it live. What do I do when I'm in my own fiery furnaces? What do I do when I face my own horrific occasions? How do I overcome? In this moment of sermon preparation, this is your prayer to God. Lord, what are you trying to teach or show your people in this passage of scripture? What is it that you want me to get over to your people through this passage of scripture? How does this apply or reveal you to me? All right. Everybody with me so far? All right. So let's talk a little bit about sermon preparation without overwhelming ourselves. All right. And, and I'm going to share some very practical moments here. Just some things that I've learned from experience with hopes of helping uh, you all to really know, because sometimes we can overwhelm, we can overthink. Sometimes if we're not careful, we'll even fall into the trap of feeling, well, I didn't do so good, or I really didn't get the message over, or, you know, they really didn't hear me today. I can tell you if I can encourage you from experience, the Sundays you feel like that are the Sundays that God has really used you to deliver a message. Those are the ones that the people will come back and say, you really helped me today. So let that be a source of encouragement. So how do we do this? Well, first and foremost, you got to have a clear aim. By having a clear aim, you're really wanting to make sure that you know exactly where you're trying to go. What is the message that you are trying to get over? Oftentimes, especially when we deal with special occasions, uh, special services, it's a good idea to ask, is there a theme? Is there a theme scripture? Because those things will be helpful to you in preparing uh, for the preaching moment. Have a clear aim. Secondly, have a clear decision. One of the things comically but true you cannot preach Genesis to Revelation in 30 minutes. You can't do it. Uh, <laughs> but you can take a piece of that scripture. And this is the thing that I encourage folks to do. As you study, zero in on two to three verses that are really going to help bring that clear aim out in the preaching moment. Granted, you're going to study more than those two to three verses, but it is going to help you keep that path uh, very simple, very clear. Have a clear, clear plan. We've already talked about this already. The importance of developing a plan. If you preach by manuscript, so be it. Make sure your manuscript is clear and you have time. I tell people, you know, because... I, me personally, most Sunday mornings, members of St. James will tell you this. If I come to the pulpit with an iPad, we're going to be there a minute. So, <laughs> but, but if I walk in without an iPad, they get happy because they know pastor's not going to be too long today. So, uh, but it's still a clear plan. Sometimes I'll come in with basically just the points that I want to touch on in the preaching moment, but it's still my plan. Other times I may have a six to seven page manuscript, but it's still a clear plan. So wherever you are preaching by manuscript or preaching extemporaneously, whether you're preaching with or without notes, make sure you have a clear plan. And with a clear plan, please have a clear understanding. The only way we can be effective in the preaching moment is we have to have a full, clear understanding 
of the word we are preaching or teaching. That is so important. Without that, without that plan, without that decision, that aim and that understanding, you are subject to find yourselves preaching in circles. You will possibly run into the, the trap of becoming repetitive, saying the same thing over and over again. And it can also lead you into a place of possibly taking scripture out of context. So the key word here is clear. We got to be clear when we present the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we present the word of God, we've got to be clear in our aim, in our decision, in our plan, and equally in our understanding. So let's, let's deal with these three keys to preparation, three keys to preaching and teaching. How, how do we deal with them? There are three. Number one, preparation. Preparation. With everything we do, proper preparation is in order. Your second key is guidance. And I probably should have given a more uh, clear definition there. The guidance has got to come from the Holy Spirit. Because watch what I'm about to say. Oftentimes we can be guided by other things and miss the mark in the preaching moment. We have got to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Again, that prayer and that question, Lord, what are you needing me to say to your people through this word? Help me bring it to life so that I can share it with my brothers and my sisters. And then third and finally, you're going to build on experience. The greatest sermons you will ever preach will be built on your personal relationship with the Lord. The experiences that you have come through, the trying of your faith, the testing of your faith, all of these are experiences. Those things that you've gone through in life where you had to trust God when you couldn't trace it. Those situations in life where you basically said, okay, God, I've tried everything I know to try and everything I'm trying is not working. Show me which way to go. Life's experiences will help you minister to somebody and build their faith because they will learn it, watch this, by your own testimony. That, that is so crucial. It's important. So when we talk about preparing, sermon building, sermon, sermon prayer, pre preparing, the first thing we got to do, beloveds, is we got to get a grip on the Bible. That is crucial. That is key. And how do we get a grip on the Bible, particularly in preparing to preach or teach the word of God. Number one, we got to hear. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we can simplify that that's by simply saying faith comes by hearing God's word. As a matter of fact, the bones in the valley could not come together and move from a pile of dead bones to a mighty living army until they heard God's word. You will not be able to properly prepare and present the gospel until you have heard it from yourself, for yourself. And I'm not talking about hearing with your ears. It's got to be hearing that comes from the heart. It's got to be hearing that comes from spending time with God. Every preacher needs to have a daily moment of meditation, whether it's in the morning or even at night, because I can tell you from experience, if the only time you study is to prepare a sermon or prepare to preach, you are missing a marvelous opportunity to build your own faith from experience some of the some of my most effective sermons that have, have have had an effect on my life have come from my meditation time and not from my preparation and study for preaching time so take that into consideration you got to get a grip by hearing the word secondly you got to get a grip by reading it 
You have got to read the word. Every day, spend some time reading the word. It doesn't necessarily have to be just to study, just to build your own faith. Uh, said this earlier today uh, in, in the service. I said it earlier today that sometimes in a time of trouble, in a time of crisis, I need to hear something that's going to give me some strength to make it. Because sometimes even we preachers get discouraged. Sometimes even we preachers, watch this, need to hear a word from God. We're so busy giving out, giving out, giving out, but I need somebody to pour back into me. So we got to spend time reading the word of God. Thirdly, we got to study the word. We've got to, as the word of God says, search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. We got to spend time in the word of God. Every preacher, hear me clearly, has needs to spend time studying outside of preaching. I can tell you also, and sometimes, you know, this is important. You never know when a last minute effort is going to come up or a last minute call is going to come up and ask you, I know a short notice, but can you come preach? If you have spent time reading, praying, meditating, and studying the word, I'm a witness. God will release what needs to be given at that moment. But it all comes in taking time to study not necessarily to preach, but to build your knowledge of scripture. Number four, memorize. Put it, put it in your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Can I tell you, believe it or not, as preachers, some of our greatest sermons will never be preached in pulpits. I want to say that again. Some of our greatest sermons will never be preached in pulpits. They will be preached in Walmart. They will be preached at the gas station. They will be preached on our jobs. They will be preached in our one-on-one -on -one encounter. And in a moment like that, you may not have your Bible and your, your notebook or your iPad or your manuscript. Get the word in your heart. So that, that at that moment, you are ready and prepared to speak a word into somebody's life. And then fifth and finally, you, you prepare for preaching by meditating on the word of God. To meditate means to take time to study closely. That, that's, that word meditate comes from the Greek, Greek word, I'm sorry, Hebrew word that simply means to study closely. I want to look at it really, really closely. And when we start looking at the word closely, which is really going to build me right into a priming, I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. When you meditate on it, as the word of God says, day and night, then you will not only be able to preach strength to the preacher, you will also be able to preach stability to yourself. And in this day and time, as preachers of the gospel, one of the biggest keys of sermon preparation and sermon building is making sure that we are strong and stable enough to deliver the word. That's got to be key. Let me give you a prime example. In the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, we find the story of the Bereans. Here's a prime example of a, of a sermon building that will be helpful to show you what I'm talking about based on the inductive method of Bible study. All right. Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 12. I believe this is English standard version. Uh, it says, then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair minded than those in Thessalonica. This is the Bereans and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. Now, based on these three verses of scripture, now, of course, you've got to do some study of those verses before and those verses after. But for the sake of preaching, we would build on these three verses of scripture as our foundational point. All right. 
How do we do that? Let me give you a prime example. All right, there are several points here in these three verses. Point number one, the Bereans yielded to God and his word. All right, now inductive Bible study seeks to have us understand where do you see that point in scripture? That point is right in verse 11. The Bereans did what? They received the word with all readiness. So automatically we're beginning to build based on our study of Acts 17, we're beginning to see how can we remember the Bereans? First of all, we got to remember to be yielded to God and his word. Point number two, the Bereans were intentional with God and his word. Is that in the text? Is that in the scripture? Preaching says, yes, we point to this in verse 11. They receive the word how? With all readiness. So I hope you're beginning to see that through your inductive Bible study, you are able to show people through the word of God what you are really trying to get over, what your aim is. Proper preaching has got to be based on the word of God. You've got to be able to show them the word of God. One of the things that I love about Rich Bishop Rudolph McKissick out of Jacksonville, Florida, is that in his teaching, the late Bishop Eddie Long used to do it too. In their preaching and teaching, they would tell you, I'm in the text. Let me show you in the text. Bishop McKissick still does it to this day. Let me show you in the text. That's what we're talking about in building. If we're preaching the word, let's make sure we present the word in a level and in a place where people can catch it, all right? Third point, the Bereans dug deep into God and his word. That's in the text too, right in verse 11 again. They searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Phraseology here, they searched the scripture. In, in preparing to preach, you want to make sure that with every point you present, you point them back to the text. Make sure you take them back to the text. Here's another one. The Bereans had a routine in studying God and his word. I hope y'all see, I just gave you a sermon. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and it's right here. Once again, we are in the text. They search the scriptures when? Daily. They had a routine. And they made sure that they kept that routine. One more. They had a purpose to study in God and his word. Guess what? And I don't know if anybody's noticed this or not. All of the points for this particular message were in one verse. Verse 11. They studied the scriptures daily to find out whether or not these things were so. So now we've come, I've got about seven minutes. So let's, let's deal with some techniques to preparation. All right. Very simple. I'm going to give you a few, few techniques, few pointers that I pray will be helpful for you. Point number one, that's an obvious one. We're going to pray. <laughs> Point number one, Pray. And I, and I tell people, you pray before you study. Pray while you're studying. Pray after you study. Pray while you're developing that message. Pray as you're getting dressed on that Sunday to head to the church. Pray when you get to the church. Pray when you get in the pastor's office. Pray as you walk to the pulpit. Pray when you sit down. Anybody catching where I'm going? Pray when you stand up to preach. Make sure you pray while you're preaching. And then after you get through preaching, I know you're going to pray thanking God he brought you through. So <laughs> that, that is the top component. That is the most important. A praying preacher is a powerful preacher. A praying preacher is a powerful preacher. You're praying for the Holy Spirit to teach you. You are praying for the Holy Spirit to teach through you. And you are praying for the Holy Spirit to prepare you. And as he prepares you, pray for the Holy Spirit to prepare the audience to receive it. Prayer is number one. Number two, study. Study, again, study comes from that Greek word that simply means to dig deep. 
dig deep into the scripture to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that's not ashamed. How do you do this in sermon building? Number one, I need you to study when you are physically alert. One of the biggest things that we can do that will cause more harm than good is to try to study God's word when we're sleepy, when we're tired, in a room of distractions, or we are preoccupied. Your mind needs to be free. Your heart needs to be free. From experience, I have discovered that early mornings work for me. Between three, four, five in the morning, the still of the morning, everything's quiet, everybody in my house is asleep. I'm, I'm in a place where I can really settle in and hear from God. So, you know, in those preparation moments, you want to make sure that you are physically alert. Just alluded to this one. Make sure you can study when you are not interrupted. Sometimes that's going to mean turning the phone off. Sometimes that's going to mean getting a quiet space or finding a quiet space where you can be free from interruptions. I'm grateful, you know, the church I pastor, they already understand and know Thursday mornings, I may be in the office, but they do not bother me on Thursday mornings because normally by Thursday mornings, I have a thought process. I have in my mind and in my heart what I want to share. And I'm spending that time preparing, studying, pulling things together. Um, that, that is key. You know, so if someone were to ask me and I'll stop here and just kind of share this with you. Um, what does a, a preparation look like for me? Believe it or not, I start preparing as early as Monday morning after preaching on Sunday. And usually in that time of Monday, being my pastor Sabbath, my day of rest, or what should have been my day of rest today, uh, I, I've really spent time seeking the Lord. Lord, what, what is the next step? Where is it that you need me to go? Really, that's, that's amazing because it comes right into this next place that focus free zone. Give me that space where I can really spend time hearing from God. Usually Monday, uh, Monday night, between Monday night, Tuesday morning, I have a good idea of where I'm going. I'm seeking God for scripture and seeking God for direction. By Wednesday evening, I pretty much have the text in mind. So by Wednesday, I have the scripture passage. If I don't have the subject, I at least have my aim. So Thursday gives me that time to come in and really sit down and begin to read and study, pull my resources and begin to do a, what I call a sermon sketch. Before I write, I sketch out. Now the sketch basically means that I, by this time have the scripture. I have what version or translation of scripture really drives the point that the Lord wants me to give. In most cases by now, if I don't have the subject, I have something to sort of stand on as a foundation. And then I am beginning through my study of scripture to build the points. Um, and let me say this because this is important. Every sermon will not have three points. Some may only have one. Some may have more than one. But just make sure give flexibility to preparing. Study a little bit every day. I can tell you from experience, one of the worst things we do as preachers is try to start studying Saturday and we got to preach on Sunday. That's, that's a big mistake. <laughs> and it's going to cause you to become rushed in your study. So take time every day, a little time every day in preparation. And then study immediately before you teach. Take the time to go back and read that text to make sure that you got it right. Go back and study it and familiarize yourself with it. Your strength is going to come in your memorization. So once you have studied and you have prayed, then you're at this phase of writing. I tell you this, even if you don't preach with a manuscript, it's important and it's a good thing to write and prepare one. Take notes as you study. Prepare your lesson plan. Prepare your manuscript. Here's another reason why it is so important for you in your sermon building to write. 
because you may not use everything in this sermon, but you can always go back and refer to something in your previous study that you can use for future use. Also, you can use it there for personal development, personal growth. You build yourselves through your study of the word of God. And of course, just as we started, we're going to finish. We're going to pray again. And as we pray this time, this time we're praying that God will bring clarity to our study, pre uh, clarity to our preparation, so that we can finally prepare ourselves for the rewrite of the manuscript that will be used, whether it is a full manuscript, a sketch, or we preach extemporaneously without notes. This is the moment where we are going to take everything we have studied and pull it together for that actual moment of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. I tell people all the time that we must remember as preachers of the gospel, we are mailmen. That's what we are. We are to deliver the gospel mail. And delivering the gospel mail simply means that we've got to make sure that we got the right mail going to the right house and it's delivered to the right person. Now, we have no say on what's in the envelope. We just have the responsibility of making sure that we deliver it to the right people at the right time. And so I've wrapped up tonight. I hope I have said something in the last 40 minutes to be of help. Um, I want to take time now to entertain uh, any questions that you may have. If there are any questions, this is your moment. Um, looking in the chat, don't see any questions. Are there any questions from anyone? This is your moment live. I want to give opportunity for you now. Any questions? See, see, when y'all when y'all don't ask questions, you make me think I did a halfway decent job. Bless your hearts. Any questions? Let me jump in here, Dr. Worthy, and just say Please. thank you for this. It was a blessing to me. Bless you. <laughs> as, as a kind of newly licensed minister, this was just rich, very rich, very God well done. And so I want everybody to, to join me in thanking you for that first. But go ahead and think about your questions. You can put them in the chat if you don't want to ask them out loud. Or yes. you can just go ahead and feel free. To ask them, but we thank you so much for that, sir. Bless you. you, bless you, <laughs> bless you, bless you. It's been my joy uh, to share uh, these last few moments, and uh, I'm grateful that we have this opportunity. And I definitely give thanks to Dr. Lynch and Dr. Barr for this opportunity. Great opportunity to be able uh, to share. I do have one question or one sure. request, I guess. Uh, someone asked for your PowerPoint. Now, now the notes are in the the chat. Uh, for people to download for their use. Do you have a problem with sharing the PowerPoint as well? Not at all. Please okay, feel so free to do so. Not at I'll all. I'll put that in the chat. You also mentioned a resource that you said was your fur, your favorite, which is, is Dake, Dak, Dak. So Dake. You would, uh, Dake. Okay. You maybe put that. Dake's Annotated Reference Bible. I'll actually be glad to put that in the chat for okay. you. Okay. All right. Um, I, I love that one. Dake's Annotated Reference Bible okay. um, is one that I use a great deal. Um, also, for those of you who are tech savvy, Logos um, mm -hmm. is actually a software package. It is extremely uh, helpful. Um, I, I love it, particularly the new one, the Logos 10 that just came out maybe about three weeks ago. Um, just had a chance to sort of work with it in preparing uh, for Bible study uh, for our church this week. Absolutely phenomenal. I mean, if for those of you who are tech savvy and want to go that route, uh, by all means, uh, take, a, take a look at Logos as well. Um, I love it, especially traveling. Um, as I travel across the country, preaching and that sort of thing, you have all of those study resources right there with you. Uh, so that, that is definitely something to look at as well. Uh, but I love the Dake annotated. Absolutely. Absolutely love it. So I'm going to keep you talking since no one else says a question right By now. all means. So no. let me ask you, I, I, know, I, I know the answer is probably one way, one time, and another way, another time. But how do you come up with your titles? That is a, that's a great question. <laughs> are they first or are they? Believe it or not, for me, uh, titles, it just depends upon my course of study, but in most cases, most times, 
my my titles are usually the last thing I develop. Mm -hmm. um, and that's only because I want to make sure that I'm speaking to the present situation. Um, there may be some times that I have gone places to preach that predominantly are younger folks. So because they are younger folks, I want to try to be able to catch something that catches their ear and that they will remember. They may not remember the sermon points and they may not even remember the scripture text, but if they can remember that subject, it will help them recall what you have shared. So oftentimes for me, that's usually toward the end. As I shared, sometimes I have it, you know, in study, but oftentimes, believe it or not, the, the topic I will have in study normally ends up changing. Um, and I've had situations and experience where it has actually changed just moments before I preached mm. because it sort of flowed with the environment of the worship experience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that just the, the flow of worship will cause you to sort of, you know, be led to change it so that it really sort of moves right in with the flow of worship. Absolutely. 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 So someone having trouble with the links for the PowerPoint. Is is everybody having the same trouble? I see I, the link. I see them both the, the mm -hmm. Word document is first at the top. Right. And then the uh, PowerPoint is just here later. So if there's someone who's having issues, just email me directly and I'll try to just maybe put an email address in the in the chat and I'll maybe try to email. Okay. Them. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. I'll tell you one thing that stuck out with me, how to make the word live <laughs> without it losing its value. That's really Absolutely. That's really Absolutely. Important. That that's that is important. important. Absolutely yeah. important. Yeah, that's what the rubber meets the road, isn't it? And that, and that's exactly <laughs> the key. That is exactly the key. We've got to make sure that as we minister to God's people, we got to make sure even as we minister that we don't lose sight of the value of the word of God, because keep in mind, as the Bible teaches us, grass withers, flowers are going to fade, but God's <laughs> word is what's going to stand. Yes, yes. God's word is going to stand. Uh, Brother Richard, if you'll look back through the chat and you actually, Brother Richard, may have come in. I think you probably came in after the link was put up. So that that may be why some of them are not seeing it. You have to scroll back. I'm getting some email addresses here. I'm okay, trying great, to try great. To copy and save some place here. Absolutely. So that I can do that a little bit later. Um, but it has been my absolute joy to share with you all tonight. And uh, for those of you who are in Wilmington this week, I look forward to seeing you. Uh, we will arrive at some point tomorrow. So if you see us, please say hello to us. I would certainly appreciate that. And uh, we are looking forward to a great rest of the week uh, as we share uh, in our convention this week. And let's continue to keep our convention lifted up and our uh, leadership of our convention. Let's definitely keep them lifted in our prayers um, as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you all so much for joining us. I, I'm grateful for the opportunity tonight. Thank you, Dr. Worthy. Thank you, for Thank you so much. Bless you, Sister Janice. Thank <laughs> you. So there's some great comments here in the in the chat. I hope you take time to see all the accolades here. Great teaching. All to words. God be the glory. Um, thank you so much for taking your time and for just preparing. Bless so you. So well and thoroughly very organized. I love it. <laughs> my joy. It is my yeah. joy. Absolutely. So the other questions we have a few more minutes. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, this, this is uh, Keith Vereen, a pastor at Providence Baptist Church in Kernersville, North Carolina. And um, I've been pastoring now for uh, about seven years. I've been in ministry, formal ministry for about 10 years. And, and what I try to share with my uh, associate ministers and, and really all preachers that I come in contact with is that, um, you know, we never can become too mature to learn. And so I just thank God for this lesson tonight. Uh, I certainly do. Uh, it really has helped me along. And, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Worthy, I just want to thank you for uh, excellent instruction, brother. Just, just outstanding. You, I really have enjoyed it. God bless, bless you. you, brother. Bless you. Blessings upon you. Thank you so much. 
And we don't always get this quality teaching, so. <laughs> oh my! So, oh my! I mean, oh I'm not my. trying to swell your head, but honestly, oh it's my! Very, very, very helpful. Honestly, to God be the glory. It's the truth. It's the truth. So it's, God bless you. Thank and, you. Uh, to, bless your heart. Keeps you and and continues to 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 lift you and strengthen you so that you can continue to deliver that word to us. Bless you. Yes. Continue to keep us lifted in your prayers as well, yes. please. Yes. All right. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All righty. This is uh, Pastor Rogers here, Weeping Mary Missionary Baptist Church there in Janesville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, we thank you for the for the word and, and the teaching. Yes, Always sir. enjoy teaching. Uh, I call it L&L, &L, listen and learn. Yes, sir. Uh, and we thank you for that. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll say like my uncle, I'm a young preacher, young pastor. I've been pastoring for 13 years. And my, my uncle told me I just got the bottom of my feet wet. So uh, <laughs> We, we thank you for this teaching and uh, that we may grow and grow each day and stronger Amen. and stronger uh, in the Lord. We thank Amen. you. Thank you for this presentation. Bless you, my brother. Thank you so much for joining us. Continue to keep us lifted in prayer. Yes, sir. We're going to sneak down there and peep in on you one day. Come see uh, me, man. I'd love to have you. Love to have uh, you at St. James. Come anytime. Yes, sir. So we have, we have about four minutes. <clears throat> Dr. Worthy. I'm gonna yes. put you on the spot again. Right. Any thoughts about the current um our current environment as it relates to hybrid worship? Any, uh, any anything to add in that in, in the in your quick four minutes now? <laughs> you are you are diving into my doctoral study right oh, about okay. now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh my 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 dissertation that I'm currently trying to complete, pray my strength in Jesus, um have has to deal with it's an actually entitled um serving the present age in the present age. Um encountering the hybrid model of the church. Um as a preacher pastor, I am a strong proponent of the hybrid model. Um, and I think it's from a different perspective. So often we we look at it from the perspective of they need to be in the sanctuary. They need to be in the building. But if we study our history and study church history, particularly in the 20th century, uh, they have not always been in the building um, because they are times due to sickness, due to distress, due to other issues they were not able to get to the church. And a lot of the things that have come out during COVID have really forced us to move in a way that we can reach out to them when we weren't, were not reaching out. Mm -hmm. The other side of that is we are reaching people now that probably would not even step foot inside of a church. Um, from, from my own personal experience, our Sunday morning worship services streams across six different platforms, including a telephone conference line, which mean on the average, our Sunday morning worship has anywhere between eight to 1200 views on a Sunday morning. And I'm talking during the live worship moment, our sanctuary only seats 600. So there, there is no way we could, even if we could, we would get all of those folks inside of the sanctuary at one time. Mm -hmm. But we are reaching people that were not coming to church. They were not engaging in a Bible study. They were not even attending Sunday school. So what I pray for the church in the 21st century is that we realize that God has actually used COVID to call us to creativity. Mercy. I, 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 please let me share that again. I believe that God had to take us through a pandemic to show us creative ministry. We're doing things now we've never done before, and we are partnering with one another, which was something we weren't doing before either. You know, we were we were competitors, and now we've been forced to become teammates because we're all playing in the same field, dealing with the same situations. So I'm I'm prayerful and I'm excited about what's coming. My my heart's desire is that even though people are not coming to the physical location, they remain in spiritual relationship. That is important because there will come a day physically, we won't be able to get there. That's right. And we're still gonna have to have a relationship with Christ. That's right. So. That's right. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing Absolutely. that. Okay, we're 659 here. Yes. Thank you so much. Hopefully we'll have some more conversation. I'll meet you sometime in the Queen City. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. And the more of your teaching. So we thank you again. Uh, do you have any closing comments? None at all. I, I okay. thank you for the opportunity. I'm grateful for the all time right. that we've been able to share together. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for attending. And with that, we will close the meeting. You want to close with a quick prayer? Please, if I may. Please okay. allow me to close in prayer, please. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this opportunity and this privilege that you've given to us to gather. God, we thank you for this time of education. We thank you for this time of edification. And we thank you even for this moment of empowerment. God, I pray that what has been shared has been a source of inf information and inspiration to your people. And I pray even the more, oh God, that they will take it back to their various churches, their various associations, their regions of the state, and be able to enlighten others for your glory and for your honor. Bless the remainder of our convention this week. We pray that you would continue to allow your power and your presence to permeate in every area of our convention. Bless our leadership and continue to lead and guide us and bless us. We love you. We thank you. And we praise you now and always. It is in the name of Jesus. We pray, we praise, and we proclaim. Amen. 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 And amen. amen. Blessings.